Welcome to Emerging with Jamal Robinson, a podcast where you hear from the diverse voices behind emerging technologies and gain useful insights for positive changes in your life and career. On today's show, I speak with Micah Musa Pellerin. So what's your dream job? Dream job would be um, ideally to be Lil Wayne's hype man uh, during his No Ceilings era. I was more um, squad up mixtape, but I'm not mad at No Ceilings. There we go. What do people admire or appreciate the most about you? The manners that I was raised with. Southern gentleman? Yeah, I'm Southern. What are you most proud of? Uh, my family. Favorite music artist, song, or album? Probably gonna go, man, probably gonna go Good Kid, Mad City. That's favorite, Good Kid, Mad City. It's the most plays, most consistent, amazing storytelling, lyricism, production, energy. Favorite TV show, movie, and or actor? I mean, it can't be Denzel, right? Like it's it's stereotypical, it's it's assumed, but it's it's that for a reason. He's that good, right? You almost it almost says a lot about you if he's not your favorite actor, right? It's like, well, who's doing it better than him? Favorite book or author? Maybe cliche, but but The Alchemist. I probably read this book a million times. Or like yeah, World's Greatest Salesman. I love these small books that you can read a million times and draw something different every time. So OG Mandingo or Paulo Coelho. If you could meet anyone throughout history, dead or alive, who would that be? Oh, it would have to be Mansa Musa. That that would make sense, right? I mean, you literally helped change the whole arc of history, right? Like Europe was in the Dark Ages, you know, when he was when he was there. So he helped educate, you know, a lot of the Europeans about, you know, all sorts of things, right? Like irrigation, philosophy, theology, agriculture. You know, so I think that's I think that's really cool. If you had a last meal, it could be anything you want. What would it be? Last meal would have to be. My mom's seafood gumbo. So if you had any question if I was from New Orleans or not, now you know. (laughs) Micah is a senior business development manager covering high-tech unicorns at Microsoft. Micah is extremely talented with inspirational life experiences. He's a philanthropist, professional athlete, venture capitalist, evangelist, philosopher, and so much more. I know you all are going to enjoy the conversation with Musa today, so let's get on to the show. Please introduce yourself. My name is Micah Pellerin, nicknamed Musa. I work at Microsoft, and my official title is a Senior Business Development Manager. If you can describe what has been like your experience with business development, like what do you do, what's your focus, and so forth. Yeah, I think the best way to think about what my role is, we are deal orchestrators, right? So we're the Bernsteins, we're the um, you know the Satchmos, like playing to the playing to the to the band. Uh, we effectively sit in between what could be, uh, but usually is Microsoft Azure, M12, our, you know, our, what I would say is like our m a team, right? So the corp dev team um, and what are Microsoft's like partnership co-selling motions. So we kind of orchestrate deals with, in our case specifically, on um, the high tech pursuits team, we partner with what are late stage companies, unicorns, early IPO. Can you explain more about these companies and conversations you have with them? The number one thing that that we're looking to do when we're speaking to a lot of these companies is help them solve their biggest need, which usually is top line oriented, right? Accelerating revenue. A lot of people are familiar with like blitz scaling. So a lot of these companies, they're at a point where, you know, their capacity to grow is not uh, won't they won't recognize the same sort of monumental growth that they experienced in their series a series b seed um raises right so where they're showing their investors like hey we grew 5x our top line is growing 5x 10x 12x it's not doing that anymore right they've kind of not saturated the market but they've you know they've taken on a lot of the a uh, little bit of the opportunity out of the market and they're looking for nuanced ways to grow their business right and a lot of times that could be through and in many ways, the only way to do that is through some sort of partnership. And that's that's kind of where we sit in there. Now, there, there are more things at play as it relates to what is their cloud infrastructure and what we're trying to we're trying to push as it relates to Azure. But in general speaking, our, our best opportunity with you know late stage startups, early IPO companies and the like is to help them accelerate revenue. 
So it sounds like to be in your role and to be effective, you'd need experience with technology and cloud platforms, uh, but you're also throwing out terms like mergers and acquisitions and series funding and startups. What kind of background experience things you have to get this role? Do people need to have startup experience? Like just kind of help me and others understand how you got into the role and potentially like what skills they'd need if they were interested in doing something similar. Well, the business school answer is it depends, and I'll speak about business school in a second. Uh, but there are a number of different ways that you can perform at a high level in this role. And I think one of the unique things about this role here at Microsoft is that no two people have the same background. We have former bankers. We have, you know, former classically trained technical salespeople. We have engineers, computer engineers who know, you know, the the ins and outs of the cloud, you know, intimately. Um, we also have, you know, former military vets and things to that effect. And I think when you think about that gumbo, I had to say gumbo right there. That's sort of gumbo of people, right? The diversity and, and background. The number one thing that sticks out to me is there's a, you know, there's a pride in performance, right? Um, and there's attention to detail. So from outside of like the, the more technical things that I think would help you, um, fundamentally, you know, you hear growth mindset, but a pride in performance is number one. And in that, uh, I think when you have a pride in performance, there's certain behaviors that you exhibit, right? You're detail oriented, you're good at time management. And as a consequence of that, I mean, by proxy, you're probably a good project manager, right? Because when you're dealing with some of these deals, some of these are nine figure deals, you're dealing with 20, sometimes 20 plus people on a single deal, right? That's a lot of different communication, different, you know, competing needs, wants, motivations, and incentives. Um, so it, it, it takes that, right? Um, so that's kind of at the core of it. Now, zooming out, would it help if you had, you know, deep technical expertise around the cloud? Naturally, right? That's what that's what we're selling. Um, would it help if you had banking experience? Yes, because you're, when you're talking about accelerating revenue, you're talking about path line, pathways to revenue. You recognize that, you know, for a company to you know to recognize some sort of financing or liquidation event, usually what the 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 purchaser wants to see or the buyer wants to see is a profitable company. And there are two different components to that, right? There's the top line and there's the bottom line. What we're offering from is is effectively both, right? Um, we're saying like, hey, listen, we have co-sell motions where we can introduce you to the Microsoft ecosystem and or marketplace, however you choose to categorize it. But we can also save you money on the back end by taking advantage of all the different functionality, all the different uh, functional qualities of the cloud and our different clouds. It's not just one cloud, right? And so that saves you on the bottom line. You can reduce your costs as you might be dealing with a number of different things there. So that's where the finance background can help as well. Does your role require good people skills, uh, good people management skills, uh, high emotional intelligence or yeah, of course, additional things? Naturally, right? You're filling in the blanks right there. These are things that, I mean, you, you might overlook, right? I talk a lot. So, uh, you know, and I know you talk a little bit. You have a podcast. But yeah, naturally, you do need to be able to uh, work with different types of people with competing motivations and, and interests and stuff like that. So yeah. And roles that I've seen before, they require you to navigate across so many orgs. I've seen there's challenges, even in the same company you can have where people have competing ideas and you're trying to bring stakeholders together. So uh, maybe for the people listening, like what are some of the challenges you deal with in your role? Yeah, I think some of the challenges you're, you're up against is to your point, right? There is an element of... of um, in selling, right? You're selling both ways, right? So that's that's where the the buck starts and stops is you're selling to the startup um, to say or the you know the IPO company, hey, listen, we're the best for you. You're also selling internally to Microsoft to say, hey, this is an amazing opportunity, right? Because there's no shortage of opportunities when you're working for a large company, right? And that's 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 always the challenge is what do you do, right? It's like, and everybody has 24 hours. What do you do in that 24 hours? What do you do as Microsoft when you talk about partnering with certain companies, right? There are a million companies that want to partner with Microsoft. And same too for these startups, right? They're the big fish, right? They're sexy unicorns. Everybody wants to talk to them. You know, what is the real value at? It's a lot of selling both ways. I'd say that's the biggest, uh, that's the biggest challenge. Okay. Transitioning a little bit. So it looks like you've been doing business development across multiple roles. So you've done this at Microsoft and in 3M and with other people. Have you noticed significant differences in like your business development role across uh, companies and across industries or is it mostly similar? It is similar. So when I was at 3M, I was working in corporate strategy. We did a number of different things, um, whether it be go-to-market strategies, pricing, the 
digital transformation, org design, revenue allocation, portfolio management. And for those who aren't familiar, 3M is divided into four different different companies, right? Three of which independently would be, you know, Fortune Fortune five companies. Well, now now three, excuse me, they spun off healthcare. Um, but w- within that role, one of the things that you recognize is whenever you're coming in as a third party independent observer, what have you, you do not have the same sort of depth of understanding that whomever it is you're dealing with, right? Because typically you're dealing with someone who works exclusively for the either business group or division. So once again, just think about the the hierarchy or the taxonomy, how how it's structured is at 3M, there's a business group. And then within that business group, there are a number of different divisions. So when you're working with them, you're effectively selling them on what is your idea and you're leveraging what is the collective genius of your group or the research that you had um, to kind of to kind of persuade them to say, hey, this is the best solution for X, Y, Z problem because of this. And you're trying to express your logic. And I translate that to, you know, when I was acting as an investment manager on the venture arm, that role was equal part corp dev as it was VC, right? So we were investing in companies, small, you know, equity stakes. We never took a took a took a lead position or priced around. But one of the things that was really interesting was we had to then sell some sort of collaboration agreement, right? So loosely the thesis was we didn't invest in a company without some sort of collaboration agreement in place. That was typically second source of supply, JDA, royalty, pricing agreement, et cetera, et cetera. That required us, you know, as investment managers, members of the venture team to go internally and say, hey, we think you should partner with this team for X, Y, Z reason. So, you know, in that, there's that that internal selling as well. So it's the, uh, you know, some CapEx modeling, different things like that. So, yeah, it can, the saga continues. Yeah, doing that at Microsoft now, too. As you're describing what 3M does, uh, Microsoft mm-hmm. has a group, uh, the Business Development Strategy and Ventures Group, laid out very mm-hmm. similarly. I'm thinking about someone who's looking at business development as a title or an area that they'd want to grow into. There's mm-hmm. a lot of different business development roles across Microsoft and probably 3M and various other companies. So when you're looking at the role, how do you know? I, I, th- I think the number one thing um, you want to do is, and, and this is more of an individual type of question. Um, so I'm going to answer it from from my vantage point. And, and, you know, if it makes sense, do it. If it doesn't, then, you know, I still love you. Um, I was more so interested in understanding what is it that I that I want to say no to? Right. The first earlier on in my career. Right. I, I think a lot of people spend time trying to wait for this wonderful moment where all of a sudden the stars align and they now know that this is what I was meant to do. And maybe that happens. I don't I don't know if that'll happen for me. I think, you know, the self is a moving target. And so I'm constantly asking myself, OK, ignorant of the industry, what type what type of actions do I want to do? Like, what are the what, are, what, are, what is it that I want to do specifically in my day to day? What type of deals and excuse, not so much deals, what type of skills deals are on my mind? What type of skills do I want to develop? Right. And so at each and every stage, if you look at my career and I've only been in corporate America now, what, three, three and some three, three and a half years. I've been super privileged to be able to do so many things. Right. I talked a little bit earlier about what I was doing at 3M. And now at Microsoft, I'm truly learning, you know, the the art of the deal, so to speak. Um, maybe not that art of the deal, but I am learning how to actually construct the deal. Um, and and that opportunity, um, that skill set is very unique because not a lot of people know how to do nine figure deals or or at least eight figure deals, especially with you know these large startups. That's what I was looking for, and I spoke to a number of different people. Wanted to make sure it was challenging. It was intellectually stimulating. It wasn't programmatic or, or redundant, right? As far as like, this is the process, this is the flow. There's no singular way to execute a deal in my, on my team. And that's what excites me. And there are no two people alike, as I mentioned earlier, on my team. So it's all, it's all once again, leveraging the collective genius of all the people that are in my group. And then that's also something that was really important to me too, uh, was making sure that, you know, I was around people that were really challenging me because knowledge is transactional, right? We're having this conversation. I'm coming away with new information, even though I might be talking a little bit more. Jamal's coming away with new information, right? So making sure to surround myself with individuals where I can say, man, I would have never thought about that. And that's, to me, the sort of like the, the sort of idea of always continue to expand, grow and allow and afford yourself the opportunity to learn what truly what truly speaks to you. That's kind of how I got here. So it sounded like you started off by knowing what you wanted, but after you did that, you did a combination of like looking at various data sources about the company, but then also going out talking to people. Mm-hmm. Like for some people, ambiguity is a negative thing, but it sounds like you interpret it as kind of this open slate. Essential. 
essential. Wow. I think the number one thing is you want to you want a role that's that's going to challenge you. That's that's because never underestimate your ability to catch on. Right. And this goes back to, you know, the pride and performance. You want to bite off a little bit more than more than you can chew because you're going to reduce that curve. That learning curve is going to shrink quicker than you think. And then you don't want to you don't want to put yourself in a position where now you don't have any more room to grow. So I think with this role, once again, there's so many different ways to do these deals. There's so many different types of companies. There's so many different ways to sell internally. I mean, you know, when you start to when you start to think about all the different possibilities and you start multiplying them against each other, I mean, it's 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 amazing, right? So it's it's endless potential learning. So that's the thing that's that really attracted me to this role. We've covered what Musa does, but equally important is who Musa is. Let's start to dive into his background, the person outside of work, and what has shaped his perspectives. As I listen to you talk, man, you seem very well versed on like a lot of topics, very deep in the industry, but you had made the comment earlier that you've only been in corporate America for three years. So help me understand like your background and kind of like things you've done outside of corporate America that's gotten you to this point. Yeah, um, I think, you know, definitely starts at home, right? So from New Orleans, super fortunate and blessed to be born into uh, an educated family, right? So my dad's a lawyer and a CPA. My mom's got a doctorate in, you know, uh, clinical psych, master's in public health. So I always grew up with a sort of like academic orientation, right? Like I wanted to be a banker when I was a kid. Banker? I, I can't remember what movie I saw, but I wanted to be a banker. I don't know why. I just every morning, you know, my dad would read the newspaper and I pull out the newspaper. I'm like, what is this finance section? What are all these numbers? And he was talking to me about it. Fortunate for me, um, fortunate and for, unfortunate for me. I went to the same school from kindergarten to 10th grade. My junior year in high school, uh, Katrina hits. I was an athlete, but I wasn't serious. Um, you know, I was same size head, half the body. I was just okay. like, just, just a clown, right? Uh, and, you know, once Katrina hit, it kind of, you know, it made life real for me. I moved to Mississippi. It was a different way of life than New Orleans. Ended up going to a Catholic school. I, you know, I went to the same school before, this little private school. Now I went to a Catholic school, much more regimented, um, serious, and strict. And, you know, it's in that process that, you know, my brother, my brother in his infinite, uh, infinite glory looked at me and was like, man, what are you going to do? You know, what are you going to do? And uh, yeah, that that kind of started my quest to really optimize, you know, myself. Right. And think of myself as more than just this like uh, independent, independent, like a uh, rogue agent, but as a part of a collective, right? Cause I started to, the gravity of the gravity of Katrina was such that I was like, okay, I don't want my parents to have to pay for college. I don't want them to have to think about all these different things. So I started taking, you know, football a lot more serious, started reading a lot more and exposing myself to a lot of different. What things. age was this? This was 16. Six. <laughs> wow. This, this is pretty prolific conclusions to make at 16. Oh, that's what that's what these traumatic experiences will do, right? And I'm not and traumatic isn't always doesn't always have a negative connotation, right? It's it's a, in some ways in this case it was a great opportunity. I mean, I didn't miss any meals. I wasn't on a roof, thankfully. Um, but I did recognize that you know my life is a lot different right now. Fortunate, went to college, played football at Southern Miss, transferred. You know, and that goes back into like the pride thing. I was at Southern Miss. I felt like I was. You know, I was better than a lot of the other people. I told the coach and he was like, ah, you're not. And I was like, I think I am. Um, left, went to Hampton. Best decision, One of the best decisions I've made in my life. HBCU ended up going from not playing at all at Southern Miss to my junior year. I was like number four in the nation, total passes defended. Senior year, I was number one in the nation all along while I was making really good grades, right? So I was a finance. What major. position are we talking about? Cornerback. So, um, and I also had a growth spurt, right? So I went from like five nine to six one, and I went from like one fifty to two hundred pounds, right? So just, body caught up with the head. Now you came with that joke. I <laughs> might have a couple. Of hey, I'm just playing. following up with what you said. <laughs> Fair, but um, yeah. Ultimately, um, in that time, I was actually going to go work for the World Bank. My finance teacher it was talking to me about an opportunity to work for the World Bank. That's where my mind was going. So I was always kind of. Both, in both ways, how you do anything is how you do everything, right? I was going super hard at football, super hard academically. Fortunately, my coaches told me, hey, there's a really good chance you go to the NFL. So I ended up playing the NFL for four years, mainly three years in, in Dallas and one year in Cleveland at the end. Um, and throughout that time, I was always heavy into startups, heavy in entrepreneurship, right? So whether it be flipping houses, whether it be, um, you know, doing – 
uh, launches and relaunch of small, medium businesses, whether it be providing gap financing, whether it be, uh, you know, all sorts of all sorts of random things. To be honest, you wouldn't even believe me if I told you. Um, I just had that sort of interest. And so that's why, you know, I decided after I was done playing football, it's like I really want to experience the world in the biggest way that I can. Right. I'm all about playing the biggest game that I can play. And that meant for me going to you know business school, fortunately getting into Kelly top 20 school, love, 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 love Indiana University. I can't stress it enough. Uh, entered through the consortium, amazing MBA program for those interested. Um, and then, yeah, that that started my journey again to where I expanded, you know, my concept of what's possible. And at 3M, I was at a company that was uh, is obnoxious, obnoxiously diverse, right, as far as their, their product offering. Yeah, so that's, that's what started that, yeah. One, you've dropped... So many things we have to like rewind back a little bit. And I love how you just talk and it's like, yeah, you know, coaches just said it's an opportunity to go to NFL. Yeah, I just went to NFL for three years. Just breeze through that as if that's something most people are doing. Uh, really? Taking a step back, something that you said that stood out to me. You were talking about the coach and the coach had mentioned, hey, you know, you're not good enough to play here. Mm -hmm. At that point, you had the confidence and belief in yourself enough to say, hey, you know what? This organization doesn't believe in me. I'm willing to step away. So how did you gain that confidence like in that moment? Is there anything you can share? Naturally, family, right? So once again, super fortunate to have a mother and father in my life that play very different roles. Right. So my mother is very kind, very sweet, um, you know, loving, you know, as you know, she's a southern a southern a southern christian woman i mean about as southern as you can think right and idealistic as you can think so all those things you think about she's those things right so she loves me something vicious right but then i have a father who's very serious equally loving but in his own way no nonsense um but one thing he always instilled with me was was the pride you know so he said hey look man you're a winner you're a winner but you know the thing is that external talk is never as important as the internal talk. So I think for me, the thing that I found really, really helpful is my own internal dialogue. I don't think there's a more important dialogue that you can have, right? This is the most valuable piece of real estate is between your ears, right? So I'm constantly telling myself like, hey, look, I'm I'm that guy. I mean, when I was at Hampton and people were like, you want to go to the NFL? You can go to Hampton. I was like, man, I don't. Yeah. I'm not worried about anything y'all are talking about. And Hampton, unfortunately, had a bunch of people that went to the NFL before. Shout out to Justin Durant. Um, but I, I knew, you know, man, it's only a function of time. The only the distance between anything I want is my consistency and time. That's that's just something I fundamentally believe, and that's guided me. As you were talking, I was thinking about sports psychology. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you kind of had that athlete's mind like well before. But would you say that playing sports helped you develop it more? Oh my gosh, yeah. E easily one of the things that you know we talk about i guess my, my origin story or this this arc that i that i've been on to of self-discovery and, and you know uh, self-development is rooted in you know katrina probably right and one of the things i recognize is especially with sports when the feedback loop is super small right in corporate america the feedback loop is is different you might have a presentation every month even if you have a quota that quota takes a quarter right so you have time in sports everything you do every day is recorded and then you watch it with all of your peers and you address it can you provide a quick example i remember when i remember i had like a very brief stint with the colts and i, I made a mistake and the coach was like pelleron what was your major and I said, finance. He said, did you graduate? And I said, yeah. He said, good. And I got cut the next week. Damn. <laughs> so I lost my job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sort of harsh reality, I think, is super beneficial. So when you think about dealing with stress, dealing with, um, you know, having to perform under unique situations, I think sports uniquely qualifies you for that. We know success comes from a community. Yeah. Who else is in your community that's supporting you? He gets mad when I call him a little brother, but my brother, who just so happens to be younger than me. So not my little brother, but my brother that's younger. Joke for him. He'll pick it up. Having him, it's that responsibility that, you know, I'm the oldest. So I'm the first one. I'm the first one down the hill, metaphorically speaking, right? Like I'm going into the real world, having him you know, has always served as kind of like my inspiration to say, you know, there's certain things that can't happen. It, it does motivate me to do better. But also there are lots of people that are, you know, entrepreneurs that I don't even have relationships with that motivate me. Right. Mm -hmm. So Robert Smith, I'm in Austin. Robert Smith. I mean, he's in the background on my phone. Holly Selassie uh, from Ethiopia, former leader. You know, he's someone I've, I've always admired. 
you know, people like Malcolm X, these sorts of individuals, pioneers and stuff who I have no direct relationship with as far as like, you know, conversation, using their lives as like a testimony to, you know, once again, what is possible, the concept of possible. And then internally, I have my own, you know, my own set of mentors that, that have kind of helped guided me, namely my father, number one, but also, you know, Rod West, Taj uh, in the venture side, Eric Reeves. These individuals have been instrumental and also their lives, once again, are a testament to what's possible. They're all supremely successful at what they do. And, you know, that really helps inspire me. I did want to get to the nonprofit. A lot of times we can focus on work. It's also important to make sure that we're making the world a better place, or at least it is for me. Right. I'm curious to learn more about your nonprofit, what it is, who it helps, why you got started, and maybe how other people can get involved. I can't stress enough how proud I am of this. About 2019... I was contacted by one of my friends, Chabu and, and, and Anobi. He and I played uh, in the NFL together for the Titans. He actually went to Morehouse. Amazing brother, super smart. And he reached out to me and he said, look, I know you're doing your thing. At the time, I was I had just graduated business school. I just started at 3M. And he said, I have a friend who's looking to start this nonprofit where they're going to help former collegiate athletes or college students that are, are, are athletically inclined, the better way of saying it, um, participate in the workforce. And I said, I, there's nothing more I would love than this, right? Um, for the reason that I mentioned. And, you know, we've, we've done some, some research and it's shown that over 90% of C-suite executives across the Fortune 5 played either high school or collegiate sports. Wow. So there is, there is something to be said about that when you think about working within the context of a team for a singular defined goal with defined responsibilities, the ability to, to manage that translates itself in the corporate world. So Amalia Musa is his name. I'm all the founder of the Make a Play Foundation. He talked to me, and originally I said, "I'm all I don't, you know, I mean, yeah, okay, I don't, I don't, I don't know, right? You know, everybody has an idea. Usually, they just stay ideas." And we started to we started to work on it. You know, shouts out to Amal. He asked, like, what do we think we can do in the first year? I said, man, we'd be lucky if we got six student athletes signed up. Once again, a testament to his his own fortitude, right? Uh, we ended up with 40. And now they end up with 40, but we started to get commitments from a lot of your bulge bracket banks, your, you know, your your Bank of America, your Credit Suisse, those types of shops. That's when that's when we started to notice there was really something going on. JP Morgan is calling, um, you know, CPG companies are calling, insurance companies are calling. And it ultimately ended up bubbling up into us having in less than, you know, in a little bit over two years, over 600 kids in the program. All right. Across sophomore, junior, senior. And we also have a program for recently graduated um, student athletes that are less than three years removed from college raising over, you know, a million dollars committed and it just being something that's, you know, been really beneficial. So one of the things that we do that's really unique is, as it relates to our program is we have a very serious curriculum. Not so much to where it's interfering with their schoolwork, but it's close. A very intense uh, curriculum where they're working on a number of different projects that, you know, resemble what it is that they will be doing in their respective careers. Not only that, but we have a very uh, rigid, as you can imagine, admissions process, right? So. We take a lot of kids from Ivy League schools, HBCUs, right, and some Power Five schools, um, but we run them through the ringer mm -hmm. from an admissions perspective. And we're heavily engaged. We have a number of speakers that come in, speak to them. We have mentors um, that speak to them throughout the course of you know their tenure in the program and outside of their program, right? So once we push them on into their internship, we stay in constant dialogue. We split them up into different teams, right? Once they come on, they go through the curriculum. While they're going through that curriculum, they have a mentor that's helping guide them to say, hey, if you're interested in finance, let me help you understand how nuanced, fi nuanced finance is. Same for marketing, same for supply chain, same for tech. Super proud of it. Love what we're doing. Can't say enough about them all and the team. Love it. I'm curious on the rigor. Like I've looked at the KIPP uh, school model. It sounds like similar levels of success, but then also similar rigor. Like for you, what is the purpose of the rigor with the program? So I serve as chairman of the board. Chris Gooding is a member, and he's intimately involved in developing the curriculum along with Amal. What we're looking to accomplish is we're trying to simulate uh, the work environment. What we want to make sure we're doing is recognize once we send out one of our prospective fellows, that's what we call our, our students' fellows, into the workforce, there are two things that can happen, more or less. Uh, and it's not binary, but it's not not binary, right? Hear me out. Either they can be a pioneer or a pariah. What's the difference between the two? Either they can come in, they can blow the doors off, and now every single person that we say, hey, we've got, you know, we've got Jamal here, we've got Jared here, we've got, you know, Kelvin here, and they can say, oh, wow, you know, we can believe, right, 
based on the brand, based on the quality, based on the consistency of the product that you all have uh, showed us, that this is a really good candidate. The other side is going to be a pariah. So we can have one person come in and intern and they do terrible and they say, you know, maybe we don't want to partner with the Mega Play Foundation, right? Maybe these, maybe this isn't, isn't the group we want to work with. So that's kind of the impetus for the curriculum. Um, it's to a, simulate the work environment, make it a little bit harder, you know, uh, put some pressure on them to present and perform. And I mean, what we've noticed is 95% of the people that have gone on to intern have gotten um, follow-up offers. And it's, it would be even higher if some of our fellows didn't go on to do other things. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's, 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 it's worked well for us. Glad to hear that you have success. Uh, the other question about your volunteer work is how can other people volunteer, help, and get engaged? Beautiful. Yeah, please reach out directly to me on LinkedIn. Reach out to Amalia Musa. Um, I mean, we're always open for more partnership opportunities. We are, we have over 40 partnerships. And if you look on our website, you can see all the different partnerships that we have. We have an alternative asset uh, fellowship now. So we're involved in, you know, we have healthcare companies. We have some CPG, finance heavy Um it's been something that, you know, it's been something that we're still growing, right? But right now we're always looking for new opportunities to, to you know, to introduce the, the fellows to new opportunities, right? So uh, we also have speaking engagements that we allow. Sometimes we'll have speakers come in, as I mentioned, speak to the students about different topics. So if you're interested in doing that, or most importantly, I feel if you're interested in mentoring, if, the, if you want to mentor one of these students, I mean, they're already high performing. You know, the average GPA is typically around, uh, around a three, four, five, three, five. Right. And they're doing that on top of their athletic workload. So, I mean, you can imagine they're already you know, primed for success. Mentorship goes a long way. If that's something you're interested in, we'd definitely love to have that conversation. I want people to get engaged. So we'll put links and stuff like that in show notes from a partnership perspective. I'm just going to give a quick shout out to Sam Oyekoya. He runs like a similar nonprofit, okay. uh, the Prolific Institute, maybe even making a connection there. Yeah, sure. Sounds like you all can put the energy together. Beautiful. Now, Musa, let's get to a question that I really care about. When I was going through your background, there's one thing that stood out to me is it is a lifetime dream for me. Uh -oh. Can you talk about playing for the Cowboys? <laughs> <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding, man. We know them Cowboys aren't winning a Super Bowl anytime soon. The hate will get you nowhere, brother. Seriously. <laughs> giving a TED Talk is my dream. I've watched a lot of them and a lot of things I've heard I've been able to apply to my life and it's been able to have positive impact. Can you walk me through how you got the opportunity to do the TED Talk and what the phrase may your dreams not come true oh, wow. means to you. Um, first, we won't accept any cowboy slander. They changed my life. So I'm always, I'm always, I'm always going to support the cowboys. I respect that. But not above the saints, but right near the saints. The, uh, the TED talk was really interesting, right? 2021, my goal, 2022, I said, man, I'm going to do a TED talk. Why is that? Because it freaked me out. And then as fate would have it, I was talking to an individual about uh, actual VC opportunity. He had a company, had a healthcare company, maybe it fit 3M's investment profile. I kind of covered Industry 4.0, it was healthcare, but I said, all right, yeah, I'll take the call. It was a former player. We talked at length and I said, you know, it's probably not a fit, um, but you know, if I can help you in any other way, let me know. He then recommends that I speak to his other friend. He tells me, he says, hey, would you be interested in doing a TED Talk? I said, a TED Talk, wow, that's, yeah. Man, you know what I mean? It's what Drake had Drake has a bar where he says, Don't get hyped for the moment and start the backpedal, right? Like how scary is it when things actually happen? And I said I said to myself, Oh man, I started getting really nervous. And that actually is what excited me, right? That really made me made me excited is, oh, okay. I'm nervous. This is something I need to do. If I'm nervous about something, that's dangerous. I don't want to be nervous about anything. So charge forward and you know, I I Man, for the life of me, I was I, I didn't I, I didn't think up until the moment I didn't think I was really gonna do it because I had so many other things going on, right? As we've kind of talked about. Continued to prep, continued to prep though, went through with it. I had what I felt was it was a great performance, a great talk. A lot of people have been really interested in it, you know, afforded me the opportunity to speak with the NBA and also do some other things coming up next year that are really exciting. So we'll definitely include it in the show notes. Excellent. One of the things that I do mention is, you know, may your dreams not come true. Um, which is something that, you know, I learned from listening to the side good uh talk to matthew mcconaughey right so two of like two people i like two people you know different versions of the same idea i'd say but two people you know uh, subjectively or objectively mm -hmm. very different right the key takeaway from that was for me when i heard it was that you know i think a lot of people in life try to define their lives by these sort of singular moments accomplishments and things of that effect and in many cases i find like the best thing that happens is that doesn't happen 
because, you know, having that singular focus, right, uh, it precludes you from experiencing life in a way, you know, that that's even more abundant, right? And that's what I, that's what I talked about. And I think for me, growing up in New Orleans, had Katrina not hit, who knows, I probably would have just went to, you know, a really good school, still would have went to a good school, probably would have went to Tulane, became a lawyer like my dad, and would be exercising some sort of like dogmatic existence, right? But that didn't happen. And because that didn't happen, because I got to see my life, it, uh, you know, turned upside down, shout out to Will Smith. <laughs> and, uh, I was forced to, to take on a different attitude and take on a more mature approach to life. Uh, it made me grow up really fast in a way that was still safe. Right. Uh, which is another thing I'm fortunate, I'm fortunate for, but it's as a consequence of that, right? May your dreams not come true. So anyone listening to this, usually if there's something you really want bad and it doesn't happen and it doesn't happen in a very finite way, it's usually making way for, you know, a better and more expansive opportunity. I'd like to leave with three questions. Okay. I'm nervous. So the first question is with all that you've done, what's next? I'm not thinking about what's next. I'm supremely present and engaged in what I'm doing right now. And I trust and believe that that will help define what's next for me, right? I'm not, and, and this is once again, the, the whole like self being a moving target thing. I think there are times in your life where you do need to be thinking about what's next, where you need to play that sort of pool game. Like, oh, well, all right, I can't do this right now. So I should do this to do this. And right. And sometimes that's like very much so defined, right? If you want to go to the NFL right now and you're a freshman in college, you can't go right now. You've got to wait two years. It's just the rules, right? So you need to define, all right, what does the next you know, two years look like? And then that, right? Um, and for me right now, I'm actually in a role in a space, you know, spiritually, financially, emotionally, um, physically, where, you know, I just want to take advantage of this moment as it's presenting itself. And because I feel like, or I believe that I've put myself in a situation where the second and third level consequences associated with me performing at a high level and what I'm doing um, will give me the opportunity to do any and everything else that I could think of or haven't thought of yet. I'm, you know, singularly focused on this moment, right? And doing just this right now. I love it. Um, so yeah. What's next is what's now. Ew, come on. There we go. Question two. I know how I'm going to follow you. I'm just going to be like sending emails and probably showing up at your doorstep. But uh, <laughs> where can other people follow you? Yeah, no, uh, please don't show up at my house. Um, the LinkedIn, right? I think that's the best way to reach out to me. I'm, I'm, I'm a LinkedIn person. Also, Instagram. What should people reach out to you for? I think the number one thing that people should reach out to me are things related to make a play first. Um, that's something that's that's you know preoccupying a lot of my, my time and mind, mind share. Um, second things that relate to business opportunities, right? So I am an angel investor. I'm an active investor. I invest, you know, outside of Microsoft, you know, personally. So if, if there's an opportunity and not like a car wash, right. But like, like a, a well vetted idea concept, if there's a way that I can be beneficial or help support, I would love to do that, particularly if it involves, or more specifically, if it involves healthcare for underserved, underserved communities, um, in addition to some things on the informatic side of sports, right, and gaming, the two things that um, if you have one of those two, then yeah, I'd be more prone to respond. Anything else you want to leave in addition to what you've already left for people that are in their career, listening to people like you for advice and motivation to achieve their career and or life goals? One thing I want to leave people with is something that I believe to be true, which is you would care a lot less about what people thought about you if you realized how little they thought about you. When it comes to you making decisions for your life, it's very important to recognize that as you start to entertain what you think other people will think, and that starts to influence what it is that you're going to elect to do, think about yourself. Don't make the mistake of doing something else to, to appease everyone, because in a couple of years, you're going to be in the same situation where you're saying, man, either I should have done it or I want to do it now. And then you've lost two, three years, right? And no moment is the same as the previous moment or the next moment. So take advantage of it now. Musa. I don't know how I can thank you enough for the knowledge you've imparted on us today. I don't know who else has the depth to cover business development, venture capitalism, TED Talks, while also covering the Cowboys, SAG guru, <laughs> Matthew McConaughey, and Mansa Musa, with some little Wayne Drake and Will Smith quotes sprinkled. <laughs> so I'm speaking in advance for others and for me. Thank you. Thank you, man. 
And Musa now has to run and do those important things that angel investing, ex-NFL playing, business <laughs> development, celebrity people do. Stop. But before going, can you quickly shout out your upcoming podcast? Something like the off season. Look forward to this tentatively Q1. Musa, blessings, peace. Wishing you all the best here now in the present. Thank you, King. This was great. Appreciate it. That wraps our conversation. Many thanks to Musa for sharing his story and for the gems of knowledge he dropped during our discussion. I end each show with listeners submitted inspirational career quotes. Today's submission is coming from Chris Oyeku, an account manager at Google. The quote reads, My mission in life is not merely to survive, but to thrive, and to do so with some passion, some compassion, some humor, and some style. This is coming from the late poet and civil rights activist Maya Angelou. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast. And leave a rating and review as it really helps to amplify the message so others can discover this content and benefit from it. And we'd love more user-submitted quotes. I plan to read them at the end of each show. Instructions on how to submit those quotes are in the show notes. That's all for today's show. Thanks for listening. And until next time, peace 